Hey, Dog Nation, I'm Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. We are so happy to have you with us, and so glad to be back again after what seemed like a long time away from doing this show. And obviously, we got a lot to talk about today as we're back in the saddle again, doing a live show that we all always have. It's John Stinchcomb later on. We'll react to the NFL draft with him, but we'll also talk about that barrage of Bulldogs selected by the Philadelphia Eagles and some fun that Georgia fans are having with that right now. And also on today's show, I'm going to talk about some pretty fair questions I think that Georgia fans ought to be able to ask right now based on some of the stuff that's going on and out there here right now. We'll have all of that for you here today. Plus, we'll talk about a couple of other issues around the SEC that I think are also relevant for Georgia there as well. So busy show for you. Glad to have you with us as a part of it. It is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. It's presented by Palo Endo Indoor of Georgia, and it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Pella Window and Door of Georgia, viewed to be the best. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. So good to be back after a fun Dog Nation cruise and so nice to settle in here with so much to talk about today. Obviously, a lot of this centering on the NFL draft, which took place throughout the weekend. Obviously, on Thursday night, and that was the final night of our Dog Nation cruise there on that Thursday night there, watching another three dogs select in the first round, and two of those taken by the Philadelphia Eagles. Now, listen, we've got many, many days coming up where we'll kind of unpack everything that happened for UG in the NFL draft. John Stinchcomb I'm going to help us do some of that here today. But I want to focus in for a moment on what has been kind of the hot topic since the uh, draft, which is the fact that Philadelphia has kind of cornered the market in a lot of respects on former Georgia players. You know, the two guys selected in the first round this year, then Keely Ringo selected after that. You go back and look at last year, bringing in Kobe Dean and, uh, and Jordan Davis. Obviously, the trade for the former Georgia running back, DeAndre Swift, which for him is a little bit of a homecoming there as well. So there has certainly been plenty of attention paid to the fact that a lot of former Georgia players are now calling Philadelphia home. Home, and the um, Eagles, to their credit, aren't shying away from any of this either. I want to show you this on the screen here for a moment of <laughs> the Philadelphia Eagles. So what this is, is this is the header for their Twitter page. So this is the official Eagles account. It's not a fan site or anything like that. It's the official Eagles account. And so underneath, you know, kind of the, the avatar, I guess, and the uh, and the Twitter username, they have, you know, their choice of whatever text to put there. And they put Phila Georgia Bull Eagles or Georgia Delphia Eagle Dogs. Clearly kind of laughing at the idea. They've taken so many uh, Georgia players, so much so they make that a part of their Twitter header for right now. Uh, Philadelphia reporters had reported the other day that Nick Sirianni, the Eagles coach, when he drove to the Eagles complex after the first round of the NFL draft, reportedly anyway, I don't think this is a joke, I think this is real, that he rolled down the window and shouted out, go dogs, to all the reporters who were gathering to kind of, you know, get ready to cover the next day of the NFL draft for the Eagles. So they are obviously having some fun with this right now. And I think it's important to note here that, when you go back and look at how all of these Georgia players have kind of ended up in Philadelphia and for a smart organization like the Eagles, they played in the Super Bowl after all last year, that, that Howie Roseman, the respected NFL GM that he is, personnel man that he is, has made it kind of clear about why it is that so many Georgia players have kind of landed there and, and that's continued now for this additional year with Nolan Smith's arrival and Jalen Carter's arrival and then Keely Ringo's arrival there as well. Let's go back to a year ago after N'Kobe Dean, the Georgia linebacker, the Buckus Award winner, kind of dropped in the draft, ended up falling in the lap of uh, the Philadelphia Eagles last year. Uh, Roseman talked about just how much he valued any player who had succeeded at Georgia because of the respect that he has for the Georgia defense. This is relevant. It's from a year ago, but it's obviously echoed what we saw again on Thursday night and throughout this NFL draft there as well. Howie Roseman, the Eagles GM, on his love for Georgia. You know, I had a chance to go down to Georgia because it's like one-stop shopping, you know. Like, uh, if I'm going to go on a school call, like, maybe just go to the place that there's, like, nine guys on defense that are going to be drafted. So I went down there, and, you know, I'm asking about all these guys, and I'm asking about Jordan, and I'm asking about, you know, the other guys on defense. And, um, you know, at one point, you know, a guy who I'm really close with down there, he says to me, he's like, the best player on our defense is N'Kobe Dean. You haven't even asked about him yet. I'm like, I'm going to get to N'Kobe. I got him. Like, you know, like everyone there talks about the alpha dog. Everyone there talks about, like, this guy. And then you walk, put on the tape, and it's instincts. It's explosiveness. It's toughness. It's just – the and you combine that with the character. And 
it's like, man, this guy's got a chance to be a special player. And So obviously what he says about N'Kobe Dean there is really nice. That's an example of a play that kind of fell to them. Maybe a little bit like the way that Nolan Smith sort of fell to them at the back end of this drive. Or maybe you even say Jalen Carter kind of fell to them, even though they took him ninth overall. But it's the first part of what uh, Roseman says there that I think stands out so much is that he openly telegraphs the idea that he views Georgia as a one-stop shop for everything the Eagles need there on defense. And, you know, I don't have to tell you, you don't get a better commercial for Georgia football than Howie Roseman saying that because here's the thing you got to understand. Roseman isn't just any GM. I think that Roseman is largely viewed as maybe the best personnel man in the entire NFL. In fact, there was some reporting here over the course of the last couple of days. You may have seen this NFL Network, other places sort of had this, that some GMs anonymously have been kind of coming out behind the scenes saying they're getting tired of all of the credit that Roseman gets for what he does every NFL draft. They think that he's you know getting so much love, so much attention, that it's actually kind of getting on their nerves. So it's not just that an NFL GM has fallen in love with Georgia. It's an NFL GM that's fallen in love with Georgia that the rest of his colleagues have kind of got annoyed by him because everybody always talks about how smart this guy is. So arguably the smartest GM in the NFL is the one that's zeroed in on uh, Georgia here as the kind of players he wants to bring in. And this is kind of funny and enjoyable. You know, Philadelphia obviously kind of leaning into the whole, you know, eagle dog thing, and Georgia fans have kind of loved all of that. But what some of you may be aware of that kind of makes this a little juicier is the fact that Roseman also happens to be a graduate of the University of Florida, one of the rare Florida grads to get gainful employment. But nonetheless, Roseman, as the GM of the Philadelphia Eagles, is also a Florida grad. So he was asked about, this is a short clip, but he was asked about that on one of the interviews that he was doing post-NFL draft, and he acknowledged that the, that the newfound love he has for UGA is probably not putting him in good graces right now with his alma mater. This is funny from Roseman. Take a listen to this. And, um, you know, I'm sure I'm out of the Florida Alumni Association as we speak. <laughs> uh, we'll work backwards a little so, bit. Yeah, this, so, Georgia guys that you've taken. yeah, so listen, in, in this particular case, not only do we love the idea that Roseman's taking uh, so many Georgia players, but the fact that he's basically had to, like, uh, step back and say, hey, my alma, alma mater, the Florida Gators, those lousy stinking Gators, they don't like me very much right now, which is kind of funny as well if you're a Georgia fan because not only was this draft, another 10 players drafted, they gave you a 25 in the last two years that's a record in what we call like the you know common draft era you know the the hall that George has put forth over the course of the last two years but not only is all of this really good for UGA it is really bad as well for one of your hated rivals because Florida like a lot of Georgia rivals in the draft maybe didn't quite have things go for them the way they want to and listen one of the things we try not to do around here very much is kind of you know, I like to mock coaches because they make millions. We don't typically mock players a ton, you know, very much just because, you know, they're a little, you know, lower down on the uh, pay chart from time to time. But every now and then we'll kind of take a pause from our typical protocol uh, when we feel like it's necessary. And certainly over the years, a guy like Brenton Cox, the former five star who left Georgia to go to Florida, that's been the kind of thing that a lot of Florida fans have tried to use against UGA. Ah, you had Brenton Cox, but you couldn't use him. He wanted to come to Florida. And over the years, Cox himself has been pretty outspoken on social media. In fact, I'll show you one of these as an example from the past. Uh, when Georgia put out a uh, thing, you know, uh, what is it, a year or so ago uh, about the grind never stops, Georgia getting ready for the upcoming season. Then Brenton Cox on Twitter comes out to say, hey, you better get ready for me. You know, that's the kind of trash that Brenton, talk, uh, Brenton Cox was always seeming to uh, talk about Georgia, always seeming to, you know, want to go out there and, uh, you know, say this and say that, always talking to himself up, always kind of seemingly being a, a little outspoken on, on, you know, about himself. And ultimately, Brenton Cox, as many of you are aware, didn't even get drafted. Brenton Cox wasn't even selected in the most a recent NFL draft. The example of a guy like uh, Cox who left Georgia, which has done nothing but produce big-time draft picks, goes to a place like Florida and ultimately did not even hear his name called throughout the weekend, had to sign as an undrafted free agent. Uh, that's not a good thing to see. And then there was the other thing that some Florida fan put out, some fan site thing put out, kind of mocking Georgia for its quarterback being selected in the fourth round, whereas the, uh, Florida quarterback Anthony Richardson was selected, what, fourth overall by the Indianapolis Colts. He thought he was going to get a, uh, a lot of juice off this, saying that Richardson was the first-round pick, taking the fourth round. Stetson Bennett was uh, only a fourth-round pick and taking 128th overall. Uh, but ultimately... <laughs> 
as you may see, this tweet pretty much got uh, you know ratioed with uh, not even just Georgia fans, but even non-Georgia fans sort of laughing at the idea that Florida thinks it's a good thing. Their quarterback was taking number four overall when they got beat as bad as they did by Georgia and so many other teams here this year. So the overall point, the bottom line on all of this is that this past weekend was a great time to be a Georgia Bulldog because you had smart guys like Howie Roseman doing whatever they could to acquire Bulldogs and a hated rival like the lousy stinking Gators all they really were were the butt of jokes, and they were laughed at, even with one of their players going number four overall. That the overall story for Georgia could not get much better than it is right now. Reigning two-time national champion, uh, one of the most talked about teams on draft night and draft weekend the last two years, and rivals doing whatever they can do to try to get some attention, uh, but ultimately really only getting laughed at. Good time to be a dog indeed right now. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Pella Window and Door of Georgia, and glad to be back with you again after what we thought was a very successful Dog Nation cruise. But listen, always fun to be back talking Georgia football with you here today. So for those of you who join us uh, on video, whether it be 945, first and 15, dognation.com, or across any other video platform, including dognation.com at 10 a.m., Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, or maybe on the radio on Athens Sports Radio 960 The Ref, or as a podcast, wherever you find them, including Apple, Spotify, worldfamousdognation.com, whichever platform you choose to use, we are so happy to have you as a part of what we're doing here today on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Palo Window and Door of George. And a big thanks to our friends at Palo Window and Door of George for making it all possible for you there as well. And a huge thanks to them also for what they do for us and the folks in our audience here, equipping your house with energy-efficient windows and doors. We're really kind of coming into a time of year in which that really matters because, let's face it, air conditioning is expensive. And in Georgia, spring and summer, you're really cranking that up and you're really using all of that so much. And you don't want that expensive AC creeping out of your house and you're ending up, you know, outside because of, you know, improperly sealed or just, you know, low quality windows and doors. You want the quality product that Pella is known for to kind of keep the inside of your house where it's supposed to be on the inside of your house. And the good thing about Pella is there as well, makes your house look better on the outside. Taking care of your curb builds just a great way to be a great neighbor. It's also a really good way to potentially benefit you on your resale value there as well. That is just what Pella Window and Door of Georgia is all about. Taking really good care of uh, helping folks take really good care of their homes and doing the right thing to make sure your home is properly equipped with the very best product line available. And that is what Pella Window and Door of Georgia is all about. So you can stop by and see them in their experience center in Duluth and you kind of put your hands on the product. On, on the product. You can sort of feel what makes the Pella windows, what makes the Pella doors uh, you know, different, special. You can feel that and can have a no pressure con, you know, conversation with one of those Pella experts that can walk you through the entire line of product, your installation options, in some cases your financing options, and you can kind of find out what is out there for you. You can also take advantage of great savings there too because between now and May 22nd, you can get 10% off your entire project or 0% APR for 24 months. That is what they're all about. So stop by and see them in Duluth. Or give them a call, 678-638-1429. That's 678-638-1429. Pellaofga.com slash dognation is also the uh, web address. That's pellaofga.com slash dognation. You can find them today, and we're certainly happy to have Pella Window and Door of Georgia as a part of Dog Nation Daily here today. All right, a little bit of a uh, update for you. We do have John Stinchcomb on the show today, but this is also the uh, weekend where the UGA Athletic Board is meeting. John's obviously a part of that. So, John, in the meeting here right now, John's going to step out a little bit later on. It's about a half hour from right now or so, a little later than normal. We're going to speak to John Stinchcomb today, and this will be a fun thing to talk to John about. He knows what it's like to be a Georgia player that moves on to the NFL, and he'll help us make sense of a lot of the Georgia players who did just that here over the course of the weekend. Prior to that, though, I'm going to go around the doghouse here today. And let me tell you this. And I'm gonna, you know, We started the show intentionally with something kind of fun and kind of light because I want to kind of get a little bit more into something that I think is a little bit more serious here for a moment and maybe not quite as positive. And if you're a Georgia fan, here's what I'm going to tell you. I think you have a right to ask some questions about what is going on because it seems like over the course of the last couple of years, there have been a lot of negative whispers, innuendos in some respects about Georgia players moving the NFL draft. And I think we have a lot of evidence that a lot of this 
cannot really be substantiated. You know, I'll give you some more examples of this here in a moment, but if you look at just this year's draft alone, think about what two of the big stories leading into the NFL draft was. Oh, character concerns for Jalen Carter. And, ah, oh, Stetson Bennett, you know, doing himself no favors after his Georgia career came to an end because of, you know, obviously the arrest in Dallas, but, you know, a couple of other things there as well that people kind of wanted to grab onto for him. And we had that, if you're a Georgia fan, you had those storylines, those narratives beaten over your head over and over and over again. But when it's all said and done, I mean, ultimately, Jalen Carter went ninth overall, and the smartest GM in the league, Howie Roseman, traded up to get him. I think it's fair to point out that after all was said and done on Jalen Carter, all of the stuff about character concerns calling him, you know, causing him to really fall in the draft, I think that was proven not to be a thing. I think that was proven to be much ado about nothing. And I think it helped fill a lot of TV time and it helped fill a lot of you know web pages and you know click counts and things like that. But in terms of actually being a repercussion that Carter had to deal with, I think the proof is in the pudding. That just simply was not the case. And in the case of Stetsa Bennett, it's kind of the same thing there as well, that if you would have asked a lot of folks prior to the NFL draft, what is the absolute best case scenario for Bennett in terms of where he could be drafted? I think a lot of folks would say, hey, somewhere around that fourth round. Now you can say as a Georgia fan, well, I think he should have been drafted higher than that. And, and you know, maybe he should have. I mean, maybe you feel that way. But the truth is, the overall consensus that the kind of top end projection for Bennett in terms of where he might be drafted was around the fourth round. Well, guess what? That's what he was done. That's what he was. He was drafted you know, in the fourth round by a Super Bowl winning coach, Sean McVay, who's very quarterback friendly. And he's paired with uh, Matthew Stafford out there. And it seems like that Bennett has kind of landed in a really good spot. And it seems like the Rams, based on some of the reporting that's been out there that you've probably seen, it seems like that the Rams were very eager to add Stetson Bennett. So the whole idea of, you know, the uh, silly arrest out in Dallas, which Bennett should not have done, but nonetheless, the idea that the arrest in Dallas or not going to the dadgum senior bowl or whatever else that was, you know, sort of, you know, kind of, put out there as, as some sort of evidence that Bennett wasn't handling himself well after his college career came to an end. Ultimately, Bennett was drafted in the fourth round. So this may have been good for kind of the media cycle leading into the NFL draft. But once again, we see an example of all of the buzz about so-and-so apparently falling in the draft. That was all make-believe. That was all nonsense. That, that Bennett was actually drafted near what the front-end projection of him would have ever been. We had some of this stuff going on a year ago, too. And, you know, even after what was a successful you know, draft for Georgia, you still have this sort of, you know, kind of quiet, anonymous sourcing on things that seems to be an issue for Georgia right now in a way that it doesn't seem to be an issue for a lot of other, uh, you know, teams. And if you're a Georgia fan, as I said before, I think you have a right to ask, you know, what is going on with this, in including the whole idea that the chatter around Carter, the negative stuff about him having character concerns and things like that, the fact that it actually came from Georgia coaches. There's a, uh, a guy named Mike Florio. You may know him. He's the uh, founder of a website called profootballtalk.com. If you care about the NFL, you've probably been to Pro Football Talk over the years. It's a you know, has been a very popular, used to be kind of a block site, we'd call that, but it's something a little bit different, I guess, maybe now. But Florio had some reporting the other day, as I said, that that the whole idea of the bad stuff that we heard about Jalen Carter prior to the draft that actually came from Georgia coaches. Let me show you what Florio has put his name to. This is reporting from him. And this is, by the way, a quote, that the Georgia coaches are not happy with Jalen Carter, and they're not afraid to say so. And that's not a typical dynamic because usually you're effusive about the guys that played for you, but your own credibility is important. That's Mike Florio saying that from Pro Football Talk. And I'm here to tell you one thing. I don't believe this. I don't believe it for a minute. I think there is absolute circumstantial, not circumstantial evidence, but I think there's absolute evidence to, to kind of at least suggest the idea that what Florio is not what it's saying is just not true. Now, I'm not saying he made it up and probably got it from somewhere, but whoever he got it from, I believe there's a chance they are making this up because I think the actions here, both of Kirby Smart and the actions of guys that trust Kirby Smart, sort of indicate that there is no deep belief somehow within the Georgia program that Carter, you know, wasn't a good guy or that he wasn't the kind of you know guy that the, his teammates felt like they could trust. This just sort of feels like, once again, something we've seen examples of, of Georgia kind of harmed a little bit by – some some anonymous sourcing kind of putting out negative stories into the uh into the into the world there in this case coming from mike florio and if in fact if you want to contrast what florio says that he heard about the georgia coaches and their belief about jalen carter we actually can go to kirby smart on the record on the day of georgia's pro day in terms of what he thought about jalen carter you don't have to find out behind the scenes what Kirby thought about Carter. Car uh, Kirby said it about Carter on the record. This goes back to uh, you know a couple of months ago on the date of Georgia's pro, uh, pro day. Here's Kirby Smart on Carter. 
You know, a lot of questions about Jalen, uh, which probably was inevitable anyway, because when you start talking about, I mean, I got a lot of questions about Trevon Walker when he came out. So there's a lot of questions generally, but with the situation, probably more um, questions and more direct. And just try to be honest and uh, talk about the experiences we had with Jalen here, which um, you know, Jalen did not have to come back and play after his first injury, nor after his second injury. And both times he wanted to overcome that injury. He begged us to put him in, in games he was hurt. So the competitive character he's shown, I think has been really good. And I also think his teammates um, really respect Jalen. Like Jalen earned the respect of his teammates. They, uh, they love being around him. So that's a lot of the things you can say about him. So I think the phrase that Smart uses there is really important, the idea of competitive character. That's one thing I think we would have all said we saw from Jalen Carter. Who anybody is when the TV cameras aren't on or when the fans aren't around, who anybody is away from the watchful eye, you know, who knows about anybody on that, but we can all judge competitive character. And, and in that situation, we saw that from Jalen Carter. I think Smart's phrasing there I think is pretty interesting. Now, if you're cynical, here's what you're saying right now, and I totally understand this. Well, B.A., of course Kirby Smart's going to say something publicly that's praise. You know, every every coach sort of says nice things when the cameras are turned on. And to an extent, that's probably true. But here's the point I kind of want to bring home here for a moment. I think that Georgia's unfortunately had to deal with more of this than they possibly should have, which is, you know, we heard Florio say a moment ago in in the quote that I read, the idea of, of a coach's credibility being important. And Kirby Smart has a lot of credibility with Howie Roseman, the Philadelphia Eagles GM, who we talked about earlier, maybe being the best in sport here right now. Do you think that Kirby Smart is going to burn the credibility he has with Roseman, who's selected so many of these Georgia players? Do you think that Kirby Smart's going to burn that? Do you think that Kirby Smart is going to somehow do anything to harm that? And what we saw from Philadelphia was not only did they select Jalen Carter, they traded up to do so which means they had to be extra sure this was a player they wanted because they're going to have to give additional draft capital to be able to do that. So do you think that that, that Howie Roseman, who he just said, I view Georgia to be a one-stop shop because of how well-coached all these guys are, if Kirby Smart was saying to coaches behind closed doors what Mike Florio said he was saying, do you think Howie Roseman's trading up to get Jalen Carter, a guy who's been said to be the smartest GM in the league, do you think he's doing that? Obviously, that's not the case. Now, I want to kind of bring this point home a little bit more, too, because this isn't the first time that Georgia players have sort of dealt with this sort of weird whisper campaign against them in the draft. It, it, you know, Carter, because of the character concerns this year, but you go back to a year ago, a couple of guys that had to sort of deal with those sort of red flag over injury concerns. And once again, you know, Kirby behind the scenes was forced to go to bat for uh, a couple of his players, including we talked about before, Nicobe Dean, who was the Buckus Award winner, who was sort of largely viewed to maybe be the best player in the Georgia defense in 2021, at least in terms of production on the field that year. And yet on draft night, uh, a couple of years ago, draft weekend, he was slipping and he was, and, and he was falling. And, and once again, you know, Howie Roseman kind of, you know, relayed, you know, the, the conversation that he had with Georgia about just how sure he was that N'Kobe Dean was going to be a really good pick. Do you think Kirby Smart wants to burn this kind of credibility that he has with a GM like Howie Roseman? Here's a reminder of what Roseman said about the conversation with Kirby uh, around that draft a year ago. And so um, I was the same way. You know, when we were going to take him in the second, there wasn't even this discussion. All right, you know, he's a linebacker. He didn't test, you know, maybe falls to the second round, got it, you know. And we picked Cam, and that was, that was a hard decision, you know. And and then you kind of get out of your mind. There's like, there's no way Nicobe's going to fall to our next pick. So you don't even think about it. You know, you're just like, I just lost Nicobe Dean. And you're a little bummed, but that's what happens in the draft. You're going to lose players. And then as it started to get like, you know, 10 to 15 picks away, and I'm a little superstitious, so like I don't even want to speak it. You know, I kind of wrote it down. I wrote, I, I, I literally wrote on a piece of paper, Nicobe Dean, Nicobe Dean, right? And I wrote it. And because I, I, I figured, you know, there's some even probably people in our draft room are like, he ain't going to pick a linebacker. You know, he's not going to do it, right? That's probably what you were saying. And so I yes. wrote just so people knew. And um, and when I walked out and I, I went to our docs. I'm like, am, am I missing something? And like, no, Howie, we talked about the Kobe Dean. Like, is it, we're telling you, we're good. If you draft him, he's going to be there. And then at, like five picks before I picks, I said, you're sure. And we went through it. And um, then it was just, you know, Really excited to get him. Once again, do you think Kirby Smart is going to burn the credibility that he has the GM like Howie Roseman by pushing a player on him that he doesn't believe in? Of course that's not the case. 
which would then lead you to believe, well, if that guy, Roseman, who spoke so openly and fondly about N'Kobe Dean and all these Georgia players, if that guy's trading up for Jalen Carter, it must mean that Roseman knows that what Florio is trying to sell at Pro Football Talk must not be true. Otherwise, you're not trading up to get the guy at number nine. You're just not. The evidence here outweighs the the whisper campaign, the anonymous sourcing, the whatever else. I think, I think the actions here speak differently than that. And and sometimes, you know, it, it's not just the the whole idea of, Oh, well, character concerns with the player. We once again sort of had an issue with Georgia players red flag because of injury. Isn't that kind of what caused Darnell Washington to drop to the third round? For, you know, finally uh, selected by the, uh, the the Pittsburgh Steelers. And it sort of feels like we sort of dealt with the same thing around some Georgia players a year ago there as well. Think about Jamari Salyer, who had the inexplicable drop. And, you know, ultimately Salyer went on to kind of prove that the concerns that existed around him were nonsense. He had a very good rookie year, as Brandon Staley said, kind of saved our season. And Staley, the Chargers coach, also, and you've heard this clip before on this show, kind of talked about some of those private closed-door conversations that he had with Kirby Smart. Kirby Smart does believe that his credibility with other coaches is important, and he's not going to burn that over anything, which leads you to believe the stuff that's been said about Jalen Carter – must not have been true. Here is a reminder, Brandon Staley, the Chargers coach, talking about private, off-the-record conversations he had had with Kirby Smart about the whispers and the innuendo about Jamari Salyer a year ago simply not being true. This is Staley. When those guys walk across the stage, you're seeing a dream come true right before your eyes. And then now you have access to their families, their coaches, how they made it here. And it's just amazing. And last year, you know, my favorite story probably from my first two years is, you know, we picked Jamari Sawyer in the sixth round. Great this guy year. ends up like saving our season. Yeah. And um, I spoke at Kirby Smart's clinic at Georgia last year. And, you know, they had a million guys coming out. He does a great job. And uh, Jamari is a guy that we really loved in the draft process. You know, kind of the rounds are going and there's some, you know, there's some stuff about, you know, some of his medical history stuff like that and um, but we love this player and we're there and it's getting like the sixth round I call Kirby Smart on the phone I'm Directly like hey man I'm like, I, I'm like hey Kirby you know, we need to talk and uh, you know and just trying to find out for Tom and Jojo and um, you know he just he says hey, Brandon I promise you this guy's the real deal and sure enough this guy we pick him he has a fantastic season and you know we probably picked him two or three rounds too late but right? you know better late than never but it's just one of those things where you're on the clock and you, you're trusting the relationships that you've built with people and you're getting that information in real time and you know for us to go pick him um you know just a, it was a great moment for the charge listen i want to repeat myself on something if you're a georgia fan i think you have a right to ask what is going on here with some of this kind of stuff and if you're a georgia fan i think you have a right to be a little bit upset about it and let me tell you what this is not. This is not, oh, so-and-so said something bad about one of my favorite players, and so therefore I'm mad. That's, that's not what this is. It goes beyond that. It's also an issue in which some of the negative whispers that have existed around Georgia players have just flat-out proven not to be true. In the case of Jamari Salyer a year ago, dropping the draft for inexplicable reasons, Chargers grab him. They say, well, hey, we should have taken him three rounds earlier because he ended up being a very important offensive lineman for this team. Whisper campaign, Jalen Carter, even the Georgia coaches don't like him. You know, ultimately, a team that has a direct pipeline to a GM like the Eagles trade up to get Jalen Carter. It seems fairly obvious to refute the idea that the Georgia coaches were trashing Carter behind the scenes. That seems like an obvious, uh, you know, you know, thing that you can pretty easy, easily disprove based on how the draft played out. Same thing, you know, for other guys there as well who have kind of dealt with whatever whisper against them, only to go on to have. Uh, you know, a lot of love on draft night, like Stetson Bennett, you know, taking the fourth round, pretty high draft pick given, you know, where he had kind of tested out, where he kind of measured out, and a lot of other guys there as well. That for whatever reason, it seems like George is dealing with a lot of anonymous whispers, anonymous, you know, suggestions, red flag this and that. And yet all Georgia does is put guys in the NFL, and so many of those guys go on to great success once they get there. If you're a Georgia fan, I think you have a right to be a little bothered by the fact that the pre-draft process has played out in such a negative fashion for Georgia players who I think deserve better from the media who covers this event. We'll make that around the doghouse here today, and we're going to get John Stinchcomb coming up in a couple of minutes. Before that, though, I do want to tell you about something really fun, getting ready to get going here around Dog Nation over the course of the uh, uh, next week or so. We're getting ready to start our Kroger Perfect Moms Contest. Obviously, Georgia coming off a perfect season. That was so much fun to be able to see. But listen, uh, we also look forward to Mother's Day and the moms in our lives who are just always there kind of perfectly for us anytime we need something. And this is something we've kind of done for uh, a few years around here. We want to certainly take some time to do that there as well, celebrating the great moms in our audience and, and showing some love to them for the great things they've done for us 
over the course of years. So if you go to the top of the page of dognation.com, you can find out all the information about the Kroger Perfect Moms Contest, and you can even find out about how you can nominate your mom to be one of our Kroger Perfect Mom winners. And let me kind of give you some of the uh, stuff that's going to go on here. Uh, if you are one of the moms that selected, or if the mom that you nominated selected to be our Kroger Perfect Mom, are going to get $350 in gift cards courtesy of Kroger. So we want to hear why the mom in your life is that perfect mom. And as I said before, you're going to get a $150 Kroger gift card, a $100 Macy's gift card, and a $100 Bath and Body Works gift card. So a lot of great gift cards to sort of celebrate the moms in our lives who are doing great things for us. So go to dognation.com. Tell us why the mom that you know, the mom that you love, whether it be your wife who's a mom or your own mother, or in some cases, maybe some of you have, you know, uh, uh, children have gone on to be mo mothers. You want to celebrate them there as well. Uh, we can do all of that. So there is a form right at the top of the page, dognation.com. Easy to find, easy to click into, and you can register. It's very, very, very easy to do. Uh, we're going to start announcing our winners here the week of May 8th. So we're going to give you this week to kind of get this in there. And then starting next week, May 8th, we're going to start announcing our winners there on that. Obviously, don't forget there as well that Mother's Day is May the 14th. So go ahead and be getting ready to get all your plans for Mother's Day there at Kroger. The food that you might want to serve on that great meal or the gifts, gift cards, greeting cards, things like that, all of that there for you at your local Kroger. And don't forget, throughout the rest of this week, we'll be taking uh, submissions for our Kroger Perfect Moms uh, giveaway contest that we'll be running here over the course of the next few days. Go to dognation.com to find out more about that. So quick reiteration here. It's John Stinchcomb, about 15 minutes from right now. Looking forward to having him on. But for now... I want to kind of step away from Georgia and look at some of the other stories around the SEC because, to me, there is a lot fascinating about uh, the draft in terms of the other SEC teams. And, to, and, and there's also, by the way, a couple of stories that have kind of happened over the last couple of days we haven't had a chance to uh, catch up with on yet. So let's do all of that right now. Uh, before we bring on John Stinchcomb, let's get ready to go cruise around the SEC courtesy of Royal Caribbean. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. It's fun to be doing the SEC through again and fun to be reliving some of the great memories from our Dog Nation cruise. And, of course, we're looking forward to uh, kind of telling you something about that over the course of the next couple of days. Y'all, I just tell you right now, the, uh, the bonding experience you have when you're on a ship like that for so many days with so many folks, it's just it's such a good time. And, and I hope that next year we're able to do all this again and have all of you on board there with us. certainly hope that's the case. But... For now, if you hear us talking about how much fun we had, how much we enjoyed all of that, uh, the next best thing you can do is to book your own Royal Caribbean cruise vacation with our great friend Jessica Slater, a terrific travel agent who worked so hard to make sure everybody had a great time on this trip, and she'll do the same thing there for you there as well. So you can give her a call, 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-9147. And it's time to get talking about the summer cruise travel that you want to make your plans for but you got to do it now because listen i'm telling you right now these royal caribbean cruise ships are selling out just like that cruise travel is so hot right now people are so back and in on this again so it's important to act quickly when you kind of set, settle in on the cruise itinerary you want to be a part of uh later on this summer i'm going to be able to take my family and my mom and my brother and his family are going to join us on a short three-night cruise. One of those things where, like, everybody's got stuff going on. You, you know, you're trying to get a lot of schedules, trying to get folks planned together. So let's do this the short three-night cruise over the course of a weekend. Let's, uh, you know, get in, get out, and kind of get back on with life. That's an opportunity that's available to you. We just run a four-night cruise. It means we left on Monday, came back on Friday. You're not kind of spilling into either weekend. For those of you who have a lot going on on the weekends, that's a great opportunity. But for some of you, you hear about all the fun that takes place on a Royal Caribbean cruise vacation. You're like, listen, I want the full experience. I want everything that Royal Caribbean has to offer. And that means you may want one of those seven-night cruises on board one of those Oasis-class ships, largest cruise ships you know, at sea. I was on Wonder of the Seas back in February. I can certainly attest how much fun that was. So whatever itinerary you think might make sense for you, there is a Royal Caribbean cruise vacation out there for you. So we're going to tell you more about our Dog Nation cruise and the fun that we had, but I want you to contact Jessica Slater, 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-9147. You can find out more about that there today. All right, we're going to get ready to go cruise around the SEC here just for a moment. And some of this is going to be SEC news that happened while we're gone. Some of this is going to be stuff in the NFL draft. Uh, we're just going to cover it all here for a moment. I want to start with this. This is actually revisiting a topic that we addressed the other day. What we said was on this show was that I thought the NFL draft would be pretty instructive 
about how the league views what Josh Heupel's doing offensively. Because you'll remember, the other day, Kirby Smart was you know talking about quarterbacks kind of off the a little bit off the off the cuff a little bit was talking about how nobody uh, you know asked their quarterbacks to do more than Georgia does, and Smart sort of, sort of casually said, you know, there are some offenses out there that all they want to do is go fast, basically insinuating that the offense is simplified so they can move faster. Some people sort of thought that was a little bit of a jab against Josh Heupel. What we saw on the show at the time is Heupel hasn't risen to the level that Kirby Smart's going to be taking sort of veiled jabs at him. If Heupel actually wins something, then maybe Kirby will do that. But for now, we just don't think that Josh Heupel's really on Kirby Smart's radar all that much, nor should he be. But Heupel, nonetheless, kind of took the bait on this because then, you know, press conference a few days later, this is back during spring practice, he was out there talking about how, hey, no team ask their quarterbacks to do more than we do based on all the decisions they're forced to make you know, in, in a given offensive sequence. And a lot of folks kind of thought that was some sort of response to Kirby Smart. A lot of Tennessee fans hoped that it was. But we said, listen, you know, right now, Heupel's not on the radar of Kirby Smart. They can't be considered rivals. But in terms of how the Tennessee offense is viewed and how sophisticated and how much of a pipeline of the, uh, you know, to the NFL this is, the draft would determine some of that. That if the uh, draft guys showed respect to Hendon Hooker, if you went in the first round, you know, if these Tennessee wide receivers get that same kind of love, then that would be an indication that, you know what, Josh Heupel is going to be taken seriously as the kind of offense that cultivates NFL talent. Well, based on this year's draft, I think you'd have to say that's actually a pretty big disappointment. Hendon Hooker doesn't go into the third round. The two wide receivers, Cedric Tillman and uh, Jalen Hyatt, they don't go into the third round either. You know, Hyatt was putting up numbers this past year that, you know, I think would have been envious for anybody. Yet ultimately, when NFL scouts, personnel men, GMs look in on Hyatt, look in on Tillman, who had had a, you know, a prolific career even you know, prior to last season, a little bit banged up a year ago. They don't see first-round type stuff going on here. Now, you say, well, if Hendon Hooker hadn't you know, torn his ACL or something like that, which obviously is an issue, but it's not like he's ever going to play again. Uh, you know, you had you know, Mike Tannenbaum, guys like that, saying they'd still drive him first round, even with the ACL injury. So it wouldn't have been impossible for a Hooker to be drafted in the first round with an injury, but the fact that he wasn't taken until he was sort of shows you that, hey, for right now, what it seems like Heupel may be running at Tennessee is viewed a little bit as a gimmick-style offense, that it didn't benefit Tillman and Hyde on draft night, didn't really benefit Hooker, and that's going to be the knock, I think, on Josh Heupel going forward of when you got Joe Milton this upcoming year, potentially Nico Imaleva, if you want to switch over to him, you know, Brew McCoy kind of becomes the next wide receiver in place at Tennessee. There's no doubt in my mind Vol's going to score points. Now, how good of a team will they be? We don't know, but they're going to score points, but – it is also a true thing right now that they have not quite won the attention, the respect of NFL scouts the way they probably hoped they would. This year's draft, I think, sort of suggests that. I don't, I don't think it was a very successful weekend for the Tennessee Vols brand based on how this year's draft played out. I'll also mention this. I don't take any great pleasure in, in, in saying what I'm about to say right now. We, even off the top of the show, we talked about Brenton Cox not being drafted. You know, We, we don't like mocking players or anything like that, but it is interesting, though how many names that we have spent a lot of time talking about over the years around here, how many names ultimately did not hear their name called over the course of a draft weekend. Brenton Cox being one of those. That's a former five-star that transferred to Florida, one of, I think, only three, I think, five-stars that Kirby's recruited to Georgia that went undrafted. Uh, a little bit of a backstory behind all of those guys, maybe in one respect. But Brenton Cox is an example of that. Did you see where uh, Jaden Hazelwood did not get drafted? Hazelwood, who's you know kind of dealt with some injury stuff, but listen, <laughs> and some of y'all thought we were too obsessed over him at the time, but when Hazelwood was a wide receiver in that class, was it 2019? Was that 2019 class? 2018 maybe? 2018, 2019, whatever year that was. And we talked about you know Hazelwood coming out of the Cedar Grove program and how much we wanted Georgia to land. What we thought at the time looked like a really elite receiver. Hazelwood goes to Oklahoma, doesn't quite work out there, ends up transferring to Arkansas. And listen, we're not happy about this. We're not mocking Hazelwood, but it's just interesting to note for all the chatter that he uh, generated on shows like this for such a long time, when it's all said and done, the college career did not really add up to what we thought it might. And he ultimately ends up kind of looking at the undrafted free agent path for the NFL career. here. Eli Ricks kind of much the same way. There's a lot of backstory there with Ricks about a lot of different things, but that's another one of those guys that, gosh, we talked about Ricks a lot, even though, you know, he really wasn't ever that connected to Georgia, it doesn't seem. But you know, he's kind of a candidate at one point in time as a recruit. Then some people thought he might be a candidate at one point in time as a transfer type name and never really materialized between him and Georgia. And ultimately for, for Ricks, the college career doesn't really materialize either. And, 
you know, I'm not close enough to the situation to know why that is, but it's just important to know for every one of these high profile elite recruits that we obsess over that go on to be great. And statistically speaking, a lot of them do. The recruiting industry actually does a really good job, it would seem, at kind of identifying the guys that can be big time draft picks. Ultimately, <laughs> it doesn't quite work out for everybody. And we certainly had a couple of high profile names. Uh, and that was the case. I saw where uh, Florida lost a, uh, a recruiting like a transfer battle to uh, Ohio State the other day. We talked the other day about Ohio State needing um, some offensive line help, some uh, uh, transfer help in particular at the offensive tackle spot. Josh Simmons is a guy they end up bringing in from San Diego State as a guy that that hopes they kind of you know kind of bolsters some of the. Uh, you know some of their needed offensive line they try to do that in the wintertime weren't able to do that try to get in the spring but the other thing that's kind of funny about this is Ohio State wins with Simmons but in Florida's case they had kind of extended an offer to Simmons out of the portal ended up not getting him on campus uh, he ends up going to Ohio State and set and instead and this is one of those things that's I think actually kind of ended up kind of working against Billy Napier in the eyes of his own fans I guess the buzz around Florida is is that Napier was trying to manage the portal in such a way that he didn't want to host any transfer visitors until after the portal window closed. And I think the conventional wisdom is, and this is not reporting, this is just people reading between the tea leaves, that maybe by holding off on bringing transfers into your program to visit your campus, you were also you know, holding off on a Florida player seeing you bring in a player to his position saying, well, if you're hosting this guy, what does that mean for me? Now I'm going to you know, think about going to the portal myself. You know, that was one of the suggested reasons why maybe Billy Napier has not been uh, wanting to host some of these transfer visitors while the portal window has been open. It closed yesterday. The portal window is now closed. But what this ultimately ends up being is, I think, another example two years in a row here of Florida just having a little bit of an issue when it comes to adding big-time talent via the transfer portal. This is a roster that has needed some help. Uh, I think that Billy Napier has said when he first took the job that they wanted to be as active as anybody when it comes to acquiring guys in the transfer portal. And yet either there haven't been the kind of players in the portal available that Florida truly needed, or in some cases when it had a chance to get them, it's just been beaten for the guy like Simmons who goes to Ohio State instead of going to Florida. In other words, Billy Napier, who does not have much to show for the start of his Florida career thus far, would seem to be right now not having a great offseason either. Obviously, the, the the quarterback transfer, he brought in Graham Mertz from Wisconsin. That does not seem to be moving the needle very much. The second spring window, the portal, does not seem to be paying very many dividends for Florida right now there as well. And for a team that struggled with, you know, just to barely make a bowl a year ago, the outlook for the Gators in the field this season, I don't quite know how you would think it would be all that much better necessarily. Uh, and then moving on here, a couple other stories. This is one that was uh, – out there last week we haven't had a chance to talk about it yet in fact that Tyler Buckner the former Notre Dame quarterback who I mean let's face it is about as average as grits uh the fact that he has now transferred to Alabama obviously following Tommy Reese the former Notre Dame offensive coordinator is now Alabama offensive coordinator and this speaks to a couple of things we've been suggesting and hinting at here for a while we told you all throughout spring practice that Alabama quarterback competition was very very quiet and we weren't hearing anything about Ty Simpson, certainly. Jalen Milrow, who did play last year as the backup, unspectacular, but nonetheless, the guy who was on the field when Bryce Young got hurt, it seems like he's still the best option for Alabama now based on guys who've been with the program. But now Buckner comes in trying to compete for that job. You know, Buckner, who threw almost as many interceptions as touchdowns when he had a chance to play for Notre Dame a year ago. And listen, maybe with better talent around him, Alabama almost certainly has it. Maybe that makes Buckner a better quarterback. Maybe he'll win this job. But for Alabama fans who are sort of hoping some sort of savior swooped in after a pretty lackluster performance by both Alabama quarterbacks during the spring practice, at one point in time they had their eyes on Tyler Van Dyke, the Miami quarterback he chose not to leave, and now kind of settling for uh, Tyler Buckner here. This does not look great for Alabama here right now. It, this does not seem like Alabama in 2023, unless something miraculous happens, it does not seem like Alabama in 2023 is going to have the kind of quarterback that Tide fans are used to having. This was a very intriguing development. Alabama forced to take a quarterback of a much lesser stature than they're used to bring into this program. That is worth following. And then I'll, I'll do a couple of other things real quickly. Speaking of quarterback situations, Jeffrey Lee, a former Nebraska quarterback in the transfer portal, looks like Auburn's going to host him. Uh, Hugh Freese has said they want to be as aggressive in the portal as anybody, uh, but you're kind of just sort of forced to kind of do business with whoever's in the portal, and there's not a lot of big-name quarterbacks in there right now. Lee out of Nebraska probably counts about as you know good as anything right now, so 
Auburn is uh, seemingly set to host him, and if they were to bring him in, kind of pairing him with a guy like Robbie Ashford, who at times didn't play terrible a year ago, but is also not exactly you know a household name, the quarterback spot. Hugh Freeze trying to bolster the depth that he has there. Then I'll also just mention this real quick. You know, I thought it was a shame to see Will Levis treated the way that he was on the first round of the draft night. Many of you kind of agree. Now, we've also sort of said around here that we don't think Levis is a very good quarterback prospect, but it's not Levis' fault that he was built up over the course of the last couple of months. That seemingly was, you know, done at the expense of Levis, who ended up getting embarrassed on draft night. But the reason why he was invited, because for the last, you know, couple months prior to that, everybody was telling him he was going to be a first round pick. And I think that he was the shortest odds to be the number two overall pick. I mean, you know, I, this is another example, I think, from time to time of the NFL draft media just sort of embarrassing itself with what it kind of blows up out of nothing that turns out not to be true. The Will Levis hype, the latest example of that. So he was kind of laughed at. I know his girlfriend kind of got some social media stuff because she didn't seem too happy about her man not exactly getting the first round love. But ultimately, even though I don't think Levis is much of a quarterback either, I don't blame him for this. He wasn't the guy that hyped up himself. That was done around him by all kinds of NFL draft media types. And it seems like we never quite hold them accountable for, you know, what they speak into existence that proves not to be true. The Will Levis example may be the uh, most recent of that. And uh, certainly a, I talked about situation on draft night when he fell out of the first round. We will make that cruising around the SEC courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And I, as promised, want to kind of get back to the Georgia part of this uh, draft conversation here. What, you know, what it meant for the dogs to have so many players selected, uh, kind of what this does for the Georgia brand and kind of where Georgia goes next, obviously, with some big shoes to fill for these guys that move on to the NFL. And really no better way to do that than with a guy who himself, you know, has kind of traveled the path of being a Georgia player on to the NFL draft. I'm talking about the former Georgia All-American John Stinchcomb. So John, good enough to join us, even though he's had a very busy last couple of days. So without further ado, let's get ready to bring him on the program right now. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. So the uh, Georgia Athletic Board's been having some uh, meetings here over the course of the last couple of days. John on the Athletic Board has kind of slipped to the back of the room here to come speak to us here for a couple of minutes. John, I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. I know you're very busy. I'm sure there's a very nice catered lunch you could be enjoying right now. Uh, but nonetheless, you're stopping by to be with us. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Let's see if we can get John turned on there i believe we have the wrong uh, all those from dog nation that were able to do so join you yeah john it was a great cruise we had a uh, wonderful time uh certainly a uh, a great experience and really one of the best uh parts of the cruise that final night we have the uh, draft party huge collection of georgia fans up there on the top of the cruise ship cheering as every georgia player was drafted i'm sure in the uh, friendly confines of your own home you're doing you know very much the uh, same thing there so i guess i'm curious what were your early takeaways from Another successful draft performance by Georgia, three first-round picks. Obviously, the Philadelphia Eagles have planted quite a Georgia flag here as of late. You know, what do you make of everything we've seen here over the course of the last couple of days? Well, it's a continuation of what's being built and uh, the, the foundation that raises up this great talent. I think the state of Pennsylvania certainly appreciates uh, what Georgia is doing, and whether it's Pittsburgh or Philadelphia and just across the NFL – I think the respect that Georgia has garnered and the players that uh, continue to come here that are talented and develop and be prepared for that next level, it's a testament that another season goes by where double digits of players representing our university are, are getting drafted and getting opportunities to help uh, NFL teams. Uh, it, it's a testament to what's being created here. And, you know, I've had some people come up to me and say, you know, can you believe the Eagles drafted so many Georgia players? And my response to that, John, is, well, kind of. I mean, I, I kind of can believe that because, <laughs> you know, Georgia has had some very good players. And, you know, Philadelphia has also shown a little bit of a penchant for drafting like Alabama players, a little bit true. And or, or I should say, too. And, you know, what it kind of makes me think is, is why don't more NFL teams do this? Why don't more NFL teams sort of zero in and center in on the kinds of productive players for great teams who've proven at the highest level of college football? You know, no one really knows who's going to succeed or not when it comes to the NFL anyway. Why not cast your lot with the safest picks, I would assume, guys who've performed at a high level at a place like Georgia? This, to me, seems as good a draft strategy as almost anything. Right. Well, I don't think they are uh, targeting schools. I just think that it's, uh, well, I should say specifically they're not looking at just Georgia. I think Georgia produces 
uh, a good product and they say, man, this, this matches up with our needs and where their availability is. And it's not, you know, I'm sure uh, Falcons fans are going, oh, we, we should do this. And, um, you know, maybe some of that's justifiable, but sometimes it, it, it matches up and there's pools that are created. I know for a while it seemed like in New Orleans we had a, a pipeline coming from Ohio State and um, when you have good players like Georgia does currently and, and you're putting in double-digit guys in, into the draft, um, I don't think it's uncommon for two or three to end up in the same space. Now, obviously, Philadelphia feels very comfortable with uh, the, the overall, especially specifically defense, uh, of, of what Georgia the, the preparedness, the level of which they are receiving these players, that matters. And um, I think that speaks to the IQ, the development, the expectations, um, the, the overall character. All those things matter. And I think you get a feel for programs that emphasize that. And Georgia certainly has good rapport across the league and, and Philadelphia specifically. So let me say this about the Falcons in particular here on this particular topic just for a moment, which is that if you're Atlanta, I mean, I'll acknowledge you have a right to draft whoever you want to. And if you think that, you know, you know, uh, B. John Robinson's a better pick for you in the eighth overall spot than Jalen Carter is, I mean, there's a case to be made, I guess, of that being true. But, John, what I can't help but notice as someone who does media stuff for a living is how much energy seems to exist around the topic of some sort of anti-UGA sentiment among the Falcons. And so what I would say to you, and you're a businessman, I think you understand some element of this, is to me it seems like, hey, while the Falcons should not ever just draft a player simply because from simply because he comes from Georgia, you know, maybe it's an opportunity to find some other way to do outreach for the Georgia Bulldogs. Because certainly the Atlanta Braves do plenty of that. You know, Stetson Bennett throughout the first pitch to begin this season. They have a Georgia night each and every year. You know, they always have a lot of social media stuff when, when Georgia wins a national championship. There's clearly, you know, some outreach being done by professional sports teams to kind of connect with the largest fan base in the state, which is the, uh, which is the Georgia Bulldogs. If the Falcons don't want to draft Georgia players, it might do them well to try to do a little bit more to reach out to Georgia fans because a lot of Georgia fans don't exactly feel the love when it comes to the Falcons. I get it. I get it. You know the last time uh, Atlanta Falcons drafted a player from Georgia? They did two a year ago. Uh, so, they yeah. did, so, you know, well, took John Fitzpatrick and uh, – yeah, yeah, that's right, and Justin Shaver, that's right. Exactly. So it's not like they never – but I, I understand, this, you know, it was – it's one of those things where Georgia is producing such great talent and you have the professional team. And, and as a fan, it would make it a heck of a lot easier for me to track and travel and, and follow uh, some of these players that I love if they go to our hometown team, especially when they're talented. And, uh, you know, there was an opportunity for the Falcons with that pick to bolster their team with a with a product that we're familiar with and Jalen Carter because we know he's going to be a game wrecker for wherever he ends up and man that would be really convenient for us sadly I don't think that's what uh, the discussion centers around in any war room um, as to what's what's convenient for fans but I think building rapport and, and solidifying a base of um, fandom uh, makes a lot of sense especially when it lines up well and uh, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that I don't think there's a bias against the University of Georgia I think Falcons last year proved that in, in drafting two of our own and you know I, I hope for nothing but the best for all those but you know I get it it might be easier to to cross pollinate a little bit I know the the Braves have a good relationship with with Dog Nation and um, Georgia football and having sp spoken directly with a number of folks with the Falcons, uh, they certainly aren't opposed to what's going on sure. in Athens and are very supportive of it. Let me ask you about a different topic. And I spoke about this before you joined us here today. I've always liked the NFL draft. It's just fun to hear names get called of you know who's going to go play where. That's just fascinating, whether you be mostly a college fan or mostly a pro fan. That's just an easy event to kind of be interested in. But, John, I hate the pre-draft process. I just hate it. And I think a couple of years in a row now, I think it has played out unfairly 
in a negative fashion against UGA. You know, the, the examples that I'll cite for all the chatter about, ooh, concerns, character concerns about Jalen Carter. Ultimately, he was drafted ninth overall by a team that traded up to get him. You know, Carter just didn't fall far enough to kind of give much credence to those character concerns, I don't believe. Same thing for Stetson Bennett, who, listen, you know, nobody likes the idea of Stetson getting arrested out in Dallas. I mean, I don't want anybody knocking on my door at 6 a.m. either. I'm not, you know, condoning what Stetson did, but the idea that somehow Bennett's post career antics were going to cause him to there were some people trying to pedal over the last couple of weeks he might not even get drafted at all and ultimately he was drafted in the fourth round by one of the smartest quarterback coaches in the league uh sean mcveigh that's about as high a projection as you would have ever seen about bennett prior to the draft which would lead you to believe that once again all the chatter about stetson leading up the nfl draft a lot of that proves i think to be overblown you even got you know mike florio pro football talk saying it was the georgia coaches that were planning some of the negative stuff about carter which i don't believe for a moment but when you add that to like red flags over injuries and things like that, boy, it seems like, uh, John, the last couple of years, a lot of Georgia players have had to play defense against a lot of whispers and innuendos ahead of the NFL draft. If you're a Georgia fan, I think you have a right to ask, you know, where's all this coming from and how come so little of this proves it, itself to be true? Yeah, there's a lot of smoke. There's a lot of chatter. It, it's funny. When you're at the top, there's everybody nipping at your heels. And I think Georgia – is certainly experiencing that. And, and when you have those dead, quiet times, I do think that there's a lot of lazy media out there that sees an article and says, ooh, that's kind of inflammatory. I might get a couple clicks on it sure. in, in a dead, otherwise dead period of time. And Georgia is a name that people are going to read about, and they're, they're interested in what's happening with our players. And so – when you have a little bit of a thread and all of a sudden you've weaved yourself, you know, a, a suit out of it, then uh, I think that's where we've gotten ourselves. I don't think it was quite the, uh, the, the level of which many of the folks um, had made these stories out to be, whether they were Jalen or Stetson. Um, you know, they make much more of a, a mountain out of the molehills that existed. And, I, you know, with Jalen specifically, I don't want to minimize uh, the, the situation that happened in January and, and his participation in it. But when you question an entire, you know, the body of work and his character and all the things that uh, people were really pointing at, I, you know, I think they've certainly connected more dots than existed. I want to ask you one thing before we let you go here, but prior to that, is there any draft pick, you know, kind of beyond, I guess, just the, the top ones, you know, Nolan and uh, and, and, and Broderick and uh, Jalen, obviously, in the first round. Is there any other Georgia draft pick that you thought was particularly interesting in terms of player, fit for team, value for the team that got him? Anything that jumped out at you about the draft? Well, I think Stetson out in L.A. I think that is a great fit. I think he's in a really good spot, and – uh, you know, he's behind another Georgia boy who super talented and someone we're, we're very proud of. He's also a guy that uh, might provide some opportunities for, for his backup just because of his style of play. I mean, Matt Stafford is a gritty dude who goes out there and, and gives his body every game. And, uh, you know, at times that costs him some games. So there might be some opportunities for Stetson uh, to show what he can do at that next level. And I think we've all experienced given opportunity he certainly excelled so um he'll, he'll be fun to watch um obviously uh, yeah, you, i was a little bit fascinated to think that seven other tight ends go before darnell washington yeah. in the draft that's a that's a head scratcher for me um so i again you, know, you look at last year pittsburgh picks up george pickens and he has a stellar rookie season um, I think they're one of those organizations that, that just values high-quality players and picks up guys um, that, are, that probably should be long gone before they're able to pick them. And Darnell falls into that category for me this year. I think he's going to have a big season for them and is going to be an immediate contributor. Finish with this, you know, social media and video stuff now gives us a chance to see things that we would not have been able to see years ago. And the Seattle Seahawks shared a great video of when they selected Kenny McIntosh. And Kenny, who obviously I'm sure was disappointed that he had to wait that long to hear his name called, was nonetheless just so gracious about the uh, the chance to go play in the NFL and to actually hear an NFL mm -hmm. team say, we want to draft you. And speaking to Pete Carroll on the phone, you know, kind of a famous coach. And 
I'm curious about your own draft night, John, about how emotional was that for you? Obviously, I've never been selected for the NFL draft, but I can imagine that must be, you know, apart from maybe marriage and, you know, having kids, things like that, that had to be about the most emotional moment of your life. What was it like when the New Orleans Saints let you know, hey, we're going to draft you? I mean, you knew you were going to get drafted, but 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 when it finally happened and when you're finally selected, like like how how much of a moment really was that for you, John? <laughs> It is emotional. It's also loud. And, you know, you're grateful because you're usually surrounded by friends and family, and they're excited for you. The only issue with that is you can't hear the coach on the other, you know, your <laughs> new employer. I couldn't hear a word of what Coach Haslip was saying. I'm like, uh-huh. oh, no. You know, get this bad impression of I don't care what he says. I could. But, you know, in the background, family is excited and cheering and crying and clapping hands and high fiving and that whole thing. So, it's a great moment, and you know I listened to the the Kenny McIntosh uh, both of his phone calls this yeah. morning, and it puts a smile on your face because you know the opportunities and all the work that's gone into and led up to those moments. And you know, I, across the board, everybody's ready to prove it, right? I mean, this period of time from uh, the end of college season to the draft, it feels like forever for these guys, and now they have direction and they know uh, where they're going to get their next opportunity and um, you're just excited about starting that process because it's felt like forever since uh, you know you've left your your college dorm room and uh, waiting for this opportunity to figure out where you're going to be playing next boy john that's a great story i appreciate you sharing that with us and thanks so much for being with us a part of uh, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Palo Endo and Door of Georgia here today. When we come back, talk to you again in the future. We'll talk more about the athletic board and kind of how things are looking for Georgia moving forward. But great to get your insight on the draft here today, and we'll uh, look forward to doing this with you again very, very soon as well. Appreciate it, B.A. Go dogs. And, boy, don't you know, <laughs> he tells a great story. It's like when you have that conversation with your new employer, unless we've all had new jobs and, you know, new employers, it's like the one thing you desperately don't want is for the conversation to be awkward and so when you've got uh, you know Jim Hassett trying to talk to him, but he can't hear what Hassett's saying, you know, tech, uh, cell phone technology, obviously early 2000s, not quite being what it is today. You know, everybody hooping and hollering there in the room. My guess is that does lead to some pretty awkward conversations. Uh, but nonetheless, great to kind of get a sense of what that's like. And, you know, for the for the parents who see their you know sons go on to be drafted like that, for the players themselves who probably, you know, played that scene in their mind out many, many times, what a magical special moment. And great job by – these NFL teams and, you know, George and obviously our buddy Mike Griffith spent some time with Kenny McIntosh this past weekend. Great for all those folks who are going to bring us into the uh, forefront on all that. We get a chance to see that because it is truly a special emotional day. And for all we spend time talking about who's going to win this and who's going to win that, ultimately it's human beings that, that, that play these games. And it's human beings that have a chance to further their life and, and get life-changing sums of money. And, you know, certainly there's plenty of room to be happy for so many George players. Ten dogs selected in this NFL draft. What a weekend it was for them. And what a week it was for us. Dog Nation Cruise has come to an end. I'm going to be telling you a lot about the fun that we had on this over the course of the uh, next little bit, highlighting some of those great moments just because I love reliving it. It's sort of one of those things. You just want to kind of go back and kind of relive it in your mind. I'll show you this today. We'll give a golden shoe here to the entirety of the Dog Nation Cruise group. This is most everybody anyway. Kind of gathering there for a fun picture on the final line of that cruise right there on Independence of the Seas, right there on the pool deck. And you'll see so many cool dog fans having such a good time. Uh, I'm somewhere right there in the middle there as well. It was just a great, great experience. So I hope we get a chance to do this again really soon. And I hope for so many of you who were not able to be on this one that you can be on one with us sometime very soon because it is an experience not to be missed we also made fun of those lousy stinking gators off the top of the program today we'll remind them in jacksonville 180 days from right now they get a beat down coming at the hands of the georgia bulldogs that is our gator Hater countdown we will see you again tomorrow and on video time now for the rs andrews cool down first time to be doing this in a little while here and I am glad to be doing it. Glad to have you with us for it. R.S. Andrews, of course. Air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised. The price is promised. You can trust them on all of that. And we're just happy to be doing this with you here today. So we'll dive in here. We'll get your comments. We'll see what you got going on. And then we'll get ready to take it to the house after that. All right. Uh, on YouTube to kick things off here today. Um, I'll also say this, too, real quickly. And this is very much a mood changer 
Uh, some of you are aware, though, and I want to make sure I make reference to this, that my father-in-law did pass away. We told you this the other day that when my wife's mom died, that we were kind of in the midst of a tough season. And some of you will remember this, is that you know around the time of the Peach Bowl, we found out that both my wife's parents were very, very sick. We had thought her dad had been really sick, and we unfortunately kind of came to realized that he was dealing with a terminal situation and it was in the immediate aftermath of that that her mom just got you know very very sick very very fast it was almost like and i don't medically know this even possible it's almost like you know her illness onset as quickly as it did almost like a response to the fact that you know she found out that her husband was going to you know be dealing with what likely you know his final few months and then you know right there shortly after christmas really around the time of that peach bowl the day of the peach bowl in particular uh, both uh, my wife's mom and dad got very, very sick, very, very fast. And so over the course of the last couple of months, you know, I've, I've made references from time to time. We've just had a very hard year and we're not the only ones who've had a very hard year, but we have had a very hard year. My grandmother passed away. My wife also lost an uncle. Uh, both of her parents, though, uh, have now uh, died here within the last month. And we have kind of known for a while that's probably what we we're heading for. And that indeed the case. We had the funeral for... Uh, her dad on uh, Saturday, he had, he passed away while I was on the cruise. I didn't make you know a big thing about this on the cruise because I didn't want to you know distract from the fun that I wanted everybody else to have on board there, and I didn't you know I, I just you know kind of wanted to kind of keep this you know where it was. Uh, but some of you were aware of this, and one or two of you mentioned something to me about it, so I wanted to acknowledge that. Yeah, that my wife's dad uh, did pass away, and so in the last you know really almost exactly a month. Uh, my wife has lost both, both of her parents, so it's been a hard year. Uh, we're not the only ones who felt that, but uh, we are certainly looking forward to uh, happier times in the future. Um, let is, let's let's kind of get into this, uh, and it will get your comments. Uh, Shuler Thomas, thanks for the kind words. I appreciate that. I always forget if it's Skyler or Shuler, so I apologize. I think I've probably called you both over the course of the years, but I appreciate your kind words. Thank you very much. Um, Taylor Russell, by, by the way, uh, pointing out something great here. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the Russell family was a big part of our Dog Nation cruise there, too. He says, did you know that Stetson Bennett is the only quarterback draft in the Sean McVay era? That is what I heard, yeah. So, to me, that sort of speaks to where, where um, you know, Bennett is going, not just a fourth-round selection, which I think, you know, pretty close to what, you know, kind of a top-end type projection you would have heard for him in the pre-draft process, but going to – a quarterback-friendly coach like McVay, who kind of seemingly hand-selected Bennett as the only quarterback he's drafted since he's been there. I'm not telling you that he's the future of the organization or anything, but I am telling you that not only was he drafted you know, at a pretty good spot, but he was also going to land with, with, with what I think can be a very good organization for him, for sure. Um, Jonathan Aaron said, what uh, – pick do you think the NFL got a steal of a deal on and also who are you surprised got drafted so late you know John kind of made reference to Darnell Washington a moment ago I think the Washington example of that I mean I think the NFL teams I think the Pittsburgh Steelers are going to be very very happy to have Darnell Washington I do I, I believe I believe they're going to be very happy to have him I think he you know was obviously picked much later than I thought he was another one of these guys that and, and listen you know the Darnell injury stuff has been very public he's had a few you know, you know, tough injuries here, but it just sort of seems like all of a sudden that became a much bigger deal on draft weekend, that draft Friday night. You know, um, so many tight ends drafted ahead of him. I obviously don't believe that to be the case. Now, listen, the NFL really likes to throw to its tight ends. And, you know, I do think that Darnell's got, you know, some stuff to show here in terms of, you know, being the kind of tight end that can be kind of a primary focus of a passing attack, something that a lot of NFL tight ends are going to be. But, um, you know, guys that were taken the first round, like Michael Mayer or, uh, you know, what's his name, uh, King da Dalton Kincaid? Like, I mean, no, I don't think those are better players than Darnell Washington. I truly don't. So that might be uh, that might be my answer there to that. Nature Gator says, I think that Bennett's going to eventually start in the NFL and become a good quarterback. He reminds me a little bit of Drew Brees, very innate quarterback skills. It's an interesting comparison. Obviously, you know, of course, John Sinchcomb knows Drew so well. But, you know, any quarterback kind of that sort of height level, you know, is always going to kind of, favorably anyway draw those Drew Brees comparisons and so I think if you're Stetson all you can sort of hope for is you get your shot you know you know give me a shot let me go out there and show what I'm about on the field and you know as I was telling this somebody you know obviously it's good to be drafted but when you're drafted the the downside of that is is that you're now connected to the team that drafts you 
And if they sour on you or something like that, then your chance of kind of getting back in with another team can sometimes be more difficult. Whereas, you know, you look at Jake Fromm, who was drafted by the Buffalo Bills, and yet ultimately his best chance for playing time occurred when he got away from Buffalo to the New York Giants. He started some games for them, and, you know, now he's obviously part of the Washington Commanders organization. So, you know, when you get drafted, it's obviously a quarterback. You're, you're, you know, you're happy to be drafted, but you're also hopeful, you know, is this team going to really value me? Because, you know, when it comes to a non-first-round type pick, especially a quarterback, you know, you can change your mind pretty quickly on stuff like that as an organization and not face too much of a penalty for doing so. So if you're Stetson, you just want your shot. You just want your chance. And I think at a place like L.A., he probably has a pretty good one. Bubba mentioning uh, Kyrus Jackson as I almost want to call him a walk-on, but he's a non-drafted free agent with the Tennessee Titans. And Kyrus is an example of a guy who I think could make an NFL roster. I absolutely do believe that he could travel the undrafted free agent route and uh, make a you know make a make a roster. And one of the things that Kirby Smart talks about a lot at Georgia practices, you know, the minimum salary in the NFL being X hundred thousand dollars a year, whatever it is, and special teams being a great way to make that minimum league salary. You know, you get on a roster, you're a rich man from the word go, and these teams need special teams contributors. There was a, a funny line when the uh, Falcons were on Hard Knocks a couple of years ago about um, – actually, I don't know this on TV. Maybe our buddy Mike Johnson will tell me about this, but, you know, the wide receivers coach of the Falcons at the time, would you know, they bring in a wide receiver. And he's like, hey, what position do you play? And the guy would say, I play wide receiver. And the guy would – the coach would jokingly say, no, you don't. Julio Jones plays wide receiver. You play special teams. In other words, if you want to really contribute to this team – you better be sure you are a very good special teams player. And you think Kiaris Jackson going to be a willing contributor to some team's special teams effort? I believe he obviously will be. And that could be a great path towards him making a roster there. Um, let's see what else is going on. Jonathan Aaron says, what are your thoughts on the Jarrett comments in the Falcons draft? I don't think I saw that. Uh, I've, I've been away. Uh, I, I don't know that I saw that, but I would like to know what it was that he said. Uh, Spencer Clark also reminding us that Tyreek Stevenson went to the uh, second round. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, when you look at the total number of Georgia players, and I guess the best example is maybe on that 2020 defense, how many of those guys have now gone on to play in the NFL and other guys still have a chance to. When you look at the fact that, what, uh, it's seven first-rounders on defense the last two years, I guess a total of eight the last three years. And that is really remarkable. Really remarkable. Jay Shipes wondering, would I date a Miami Hurricane casual fan? I have some tough decisions. Listen, I think all Miami fans are basically just casual fans. So, so the idea of a, a casual Miami fan, that might be somewhat redundant. Um, Cardius Williams and Johnny Surfdog talking about Eric Gilbert at Nebraska. I mean, look, here's the thing is that you know, this is a guy that even, I mean, Terrence Edwards told us a year ago, and in looking back, it's easy to understand why Terrence was saying what he was saying. Even after Gilbert had two touchdowns in the spring game, uh, Terrence's words to us on Dog Nation Daily many times, and nobody knows Eric better than Terrence does, I don't believe. Uh, Terrence's words to us that the idea of an All-American season for Gilbert would just be being out there and just being a contributor, that that would be – Terrence's view of an all-American type season for Eric Gilbert that the path that he was traveling to get back to football was a significant one it was not necessarily going to be easy and this is one of those things that I don't believe just a change of scenery alone was going to magically wave some sort of uh you know flag here for Gilbert um I, I realize that's an incredibly complicated thing to try to understand it's I think it's at times even kind of complicated for me but the truth is is that Eric Gilbert is just a on a difficult journey and marshalling all the talent he has and putting that on display in a football field has just proven to be really difficult. I actually don't even really blame him for that. I think he's dealing with a lot of really, really tough stuff. Uh, and I hope that he does succeed there at uh, Nebraska. I really do. Um, if he has big games, you know, big moments, I'll be standing up and cheering as loudly as anybody. But, you know, this is not one of those things where, you know, Georgia squandered that talent or, you know, you know, somehow, you know, he was in the doghouse even here at Georgia. It was not one of those things at all. Georgia, I think, tried to get everything it could, uh, you know, from Gilbert, you know, provide him every opportunity to kind of be back on the football field. And it just wasn't working out. And I don't believe it gets magically easier for him just because he's moving to Nebraska, unfortunately. Um, uh, 
okay, so Jonathan Aaron giving a little bit more uh, thought on Jarrett. I mean, listen, these young football players are not professional communicators, and this is one of those things where, you know, social media sometimes does them a disservice because I think it gives, uh, uh, I think it gives them a platform to to speak at a time in which they otherwise wouldn't. So I didn't see that, didn't hear that, um, but I guess I'm going to reserve you know judgment on that for now. Um, but you know, these are not professional communicators. Um, uh, that's funny. William Perry says what happens on the uh, cruise stays on the cruise. Yeah, no doubt about that. No doubt about that. That uh, Good times that you had to be a part of to enjoy. Uh, let's see what else. Um, let's see what else. Scott Harris says, I was surprised so many Gators got drafted. Makes you wonder about Napier's future. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, F- Florida wasn't that great a year ago. When you think about what they've lost, all of a sudden it's going to be hard for them to do <laughs> It becomes tough to replace what they did lose, for sure. All right, let's see what else. Over here on YouTube, I'm sorry, I should say Facebook here for a moment. On the Facebook side of things, and by the way, it's really good to be doing this again. I also notice as I see myself on the screen here, I am in desperate need of a haircut. Hopefully we'll get that get that done pretty soon. Uh, Gerald Harmon, uh, obviously... <laughs> A big fan of that Marietta program says uh, Eric Gilbert, always a blue devil. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. Uh, William Camacho, thank you for the kind words. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Keith Holt says, my wife and I decided we want to go on the cruise next year. Keith, I hope hope we're able to have have you there. It'd be great. So great. Um, Brandon Griffin says, anybody else notice the shameless self-promotion by Saban on draft nine shows just how desperate he has become the coaching uh uh, trying to you know close the coach the co- coaching culture uh, gap between UGA George Alabama, it's continuing to widen. Yeah, listen, Nick Saban has become very media friendly in sort of the late stage of his coaching life in a way that he didn't used to be. You know, at one point in time, Saban you know just uh, didn't think he needed the media. Now you sort of get the impression that Saban does think that he needs the media. That's why he's become so accessible, especially to the ESPN media, which sort of leads you to believe. I wonder if that means that that Saban's view of his own team has kind of changed a little bit, that he all of a sudden now feels the need to leverage the media as much as he does. Uh, Pete Williams taking a little bit of a jab there at Mel Kuyper Jr. Um, Let's see what else. Gary Holt checking out. Gary, appreciate you being here. Um, Dana Roper says, I hope the next time someone mentions the Jalen Carter thing, uh, that respectfully he'll just say that's in his past. It has nothing to do with my football skills. Looking forward to my future as an eagle. I'm sure he will say something about that. And and you know, you know, Donna. Here's the also the problem too is that you know some of the stuff that Jalen Carter has dealt with in terms of like the negative perception of him actually predates the issue with the car crash. That that you know, uh, Todd McShay was out there saying what he was saying before the car crash took place. And look. McShay's not going to make that up out of thin air. He was clearly hearing it from somewhere, and whoever he was hearing that from had to be close enough to the situation to at least have some credibility in McShay's mind. But the idea that somehow the Georgia coaches did not like Carter or didn't think that Carter was a good teammate or something like that, the simple point we've made is if that was true, then Howie Roseman, who's got the ultimate pipeline directly to Kirby Smart, is not trading up to get Jalen Carter. It's just not. It's just not. So – so, while, you know, I don't, I don't know that any of these national type reporters are going to make any of this up out of whole claw. They're not going to just, you know, completely fabricate this. Would they possibly embellish this to get more attention? Maybe so. And it certainly seems like some of this stuff has been greatly embellished. Uh, let's see what else. Um. Alan Verbonchik says that Philadelphia is building an all-dog defense. Yeah, it's fun to think about that. David Faulkner talking about Keely Ringo. I guess the one thing you kind of hear about Ringo is, and I'm not a scout, don't pretend to be one, but obviously we know the straight line speed is there when it comes to Keely. We know the the size, the long arm is the kind of stuff that these NFL teams cover. That's cl- clearly there as well. I guess it's somewhat like the, 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 the twitchiness, for lack of a better phrase, that I, I guess he's been kind of knocked on. The hip turn, the, the, the lateral quickness cone drill type stuff. That, that you might want to see a little bit more from Ringo. And maybe when we saw Keeley have less than great moments in the field, maybe that's where some of that came from. That there's, you know, according to NFL types, 
there's you know a certain kind of system in coverage that Keely Ringo can be very very good for, and maybe a certain you know kind of coverage style that he might not be such a great fit for, and you know he has a chance now to kind of go out there and and sort of you know confound some of those expectations, be better than some people thought he could be, and obviously I hope that's what he's able to do. Uh, Randy Hall asked about Adam Anderson. No, as far as um, as far as I know, uh, Anderson's still in the middle of the the legal process here. So a, a long, stretched out, you know, thing for him. So until that's cleared up, one way or another, um, you know, Anderson really doesn't have the opportunity to kind of move on with his football career. Um, so I mean, at some point, I'm guessing we'll hear a little bit more about that, but. That's obviously something that continues to play out, and it seems like it's been a long time. I think one of the things that a lot of us are not fully aware of is just how long some of this, uh, you know, kind of wheels of justice, just how slowly sometimes some of this spins. I saw a story the other day. This has got nothing to do with football, but uh, there was a guy in, I want to say it was maybe like Doherty County, maybe, like down there where our Albany is, uh, and I think he's been waiting like 10 years to – to stand trial for murder. Now I don't know what the complication of it. It's called his last full decade, but but I in reading about that it made me kind of think about the Anderson situation because for a lot of us, gosh, it seems like this Adam Anderson legal process has just played out very, very slowly. But, you know, maybe the the process legally just plays out more slowly, more commonly than we realize. Maybe. Um that's obviously not quite my lane. Brandon Griffin says, at some point, there will be a movie about Stetson. If a story arc ends in a Super Bowl victory as an NFL GM, would you want to be the team in that movie story? McVay saw potential in picking Stetson. You may be, may be right about that. Uh, that's true. And I think that the, you know, the idea of Stetson as the underdog overcoming all the odds, one of the reasons I think that Bennett has kind of at times been misunderstood is, is and I've talked about this before, is that Anytime you have like a contradiction in storytelling, it always makes the story confusing. So Bennett is the underdog quarterback, but he's playing for the team that's anything but an underdog. You know, Georgia's a massive favorite in every game that it plays. And so I think at times that has caused certain media types to have a hard time understanding how to process what Stetson Bennett is. Bennett's the, you know, sort of guy that's overcome all the odds, but Georgia has always been the program that has kind of had the odds on its side. It just always seemed like that Stetson Bennett was the quarterback for the wrong team, that that George needed a quarterback that was a little bit more of the sort of five-star variety, the way that so many of the other players were on the roster, uh, and that, that Bennett, you know, as the ultimate underdog, ought to be doing his ultimate underdog thing for more of an underdog-type program. There's always been a little bit of a contradiction in storytelling when it comes to Bennett at Georgia, but ultimately, you know, Bennett did defy odds and helped Georgia, you know, obviously fulfill the potential that it has as a program, and if he goes on now and has that additional moment there in the NFL, it will be one of the great stories we've ever seen. Legitimately one of the great stories because, you know, legitimately Stetson Bennett has been completely counted out seemingly many, many times. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Brandon Griffin says we may start seeing litigation against irresponsible reporting that affects these guys draft stock. Literally can cost these guys, you know, these kids millions. So I don't even know about the litigation part of this because I don't even want, <laughs> I certainly don't want people suing me every time I get something wrong. But my point is, you know, don't drag them into a court of law necessarily. But can we at least point out who got stuff wrong? I mean, can we at least see so what happens is we have like this, you know, you know, m several month period where every opinion imaginable just vomited out onto the internet or onto TV or whatever else. And then once the draft is over, we just sort of move on to the next thing. You know, we grade the drafts. You know, you can go online right now and find out what kind of grade the Falcons got or the Eagles got or wherever else. We, we grade the drafts. Can we just grade the pundits? I'm not saying, you know, sue them into oblivion. Um, but can we can we at least just grade their performance of, hey, you said that Jalen Carter had red flags, yet the smartest GM in the league just traded up to get him. Maybe you were wrong about that. I mean, ultimately – how many teams really even passed on Carter? Several of those teams drafted quarterback. Uh, one of those teams drafted Will Anderson, uh, who, you know, if you want to go back a year ago, was probably thought to be drafted ahead of Carter anyway. Uh, Falcons took B. John Robbins, but they don't ever get a pick right. So, you know, uh, I don't know that you take much for that. When it was all said and done, I mean, how many teams really even passed on Jalen Carter? I would say not that many. So for all the people who were like, red flag this, red flag that, that ended up being a lot of noise not connected to reality, I don't believe. 
And, you know, the same thing for some of the Stetson stuff. For months, oh, Stetson Bennett handling himself poorly. Stetson Bennett needs to grow up. Stetson Bennett better hope, you know, the the interviews go well. Otherwise, he might not be drafted at all. He's drafted in the fourth round by Sean McVay. I mean, that ended up being, once again, much ado about nothing. Let's grade these pundits. Let's, you know, let's just go back and kind of recount who said what. And, listen, I don't mind y'all doing that about me. Some of you take great pleasure in pointing out, you know, some of the ridiculous things I've said over the years. No one's going to bat a 1,000. No one's going to bat, come close to batting a thousand when it comes to some of this kind of stuff. But if you want less of this negative nonsense leading to next year's draft, pointing out who got it wrong might not be a bad thing to do. Um, Brandon Griffin said I'd have a triple A grade. Uh, well, depending on what the scale is, that might not be so bad, right? Um, Craig Jones says vomited is the right word. The pundits don't get held accountable. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. It's like, let's, let's hold these guys. Like, what was the one the other day that kind of get went viral? What was this? Oh, it was um, Merrill Hodge on with Skip and Stephen A. when they worked together. This clip went viral the other day. I don't even really know why. Old clip that just got revisited. And uh, uh, Merrill Hodge was basically like saying that he wouldn't draft Johnny Manziel at all. That he wouldn't even consider drafting him. I think that's what he was saying. And like Skip Bayless was like, they're going to draft a number one overall. And obviously, you know, that's laughable now. So we, we kind of do this with like, you know, guys like Skip and Stephen A because that's sort of funny. But we ought to do this with the guys who are meant to be taken seriously and sort of judge some of the stuff that they say. Because, you know, just because somebody famous told you this off the record, you know, doesn't mean that, that you have the freedom to just run with it. That, that we would say that some of these national reporter types – who will essentially do anything for access. I mean, they will literally do anything for access, it seems like. Uh, that, you know, if you just kind of run with whatever, you know, one of your cherished sources told you off the record, that turns out to be laughably false. You ought to get called out for that, I think, anyway. Um, uh, Barcelona King, thank you for the nice words. Uh, glad to be back there as well. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Um Orin Chile on the subject of Stetson being kind of, you know, seeming like a humble kid, but then kind of comes across a little bit cocky. Yeah, that's the thing about Stetson. He's always been a little bit more of that than maybe people realize. He's always been a little bit, you know, swaggier, if that's the right word. You know, because he's a former walk-on, you might sort of think of him as like George's version of Rudy, but that has never been the way that Stetson Bennett saw himself. You know, Stetson Bennett thinks all the people around him that don't recognize how good he is at football, they're idiots for not re realizing how good he is. And you need a little bit of that to be able to be a quarterback. Uh, but that's the other thing that I think has caused some people to confuse the Stetson story. You know, Stetson's never exactly been this, you know, all shucks, golly gee whiz type kid who's just sort of glad for his chance. You know, I mean, if you ask Stetson right now, does he believe he should be starting a game in the NFL? I'm sure he probably believes he should be. Um, George Hernan said, what about what Reese Davis said about Stetson? George, remind me what that was. Remind me what that was. Um, I, I don't quite remember that. Uh, all right, let me uh, get some dognation.com comments. Uh, Rambo says, I believe to qualify for litigation, the plaintiff has to prove malice. That is that is probably true. That sounds like something that would be true. Uh, Richard E. says, NFL running back. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, Maurice Jones-Drew, I saw this. <laughs> So, yeah, Richard's talking about what Maurice Jones-Drew said on the NFL Network, that all these Georgia players don't get to play Vanderbilt anymore. In other words, saying that, okay, well, they look good coming out of college because of whatever, but they don't get to play Vanderbilt. But that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You know, it's like, you know, Georgia's 29-1 and one over the course of the last two years. They're not playing Vanderbilt in each and every one of those games. In fact, in 2020, they didn't even get to play Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt didn't show up for the game. So, I mean, that's clearly just a guy trying to talk. I mean, I mean, just clearly – I'm sure that probably came late after a long broadcast day. You're sort of running out of things to say, but that was one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. I mean, Maurice Jones-Drew went to UCLA, for goodness sakes. Um, let's see what else. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Jacob Yarbrough asked a good, good question. So last week we talked about the three games that are kind of, I think, the most telling for Georgia the upcoming season. And Jacob says, I noticed the Ole Miss game was not on that list. How do you feel about that game? So I do think that Ole Miss has a chance to be pretty good when Georgia plays them. 
But the game does come late in the year. And so by that point in time, you know, Ole Miss is going to have a decently tough schedule. They will have probably lost a few games. So if the game was earlier, in other words, if you kind of, you know, move that game, you know, up to early October or something like that, there's a chance that Ole Miss still has probably a nice record and maybe even kind of a nice ranking next to its name. That could have made that game potentially feel bigger. But where the game comes in November, by that point in time, we've probably settled into, unless Ole Miss just plays way above the level that I expect them to play at, where you don't quite have the same level of cachet for that game because it comes later in the season. But putting aside the perception of the game, the actual quality of the opponent, here's what I'll tell you. A lot of this for me kind of centers around how much – Ole Miss gets out of its quarterback this year. You know, Jackson Dart transferred last year from USC to Oxford. And I don't really think that that, that Dart had that good of a year. I don't. And so this year, you know, Ole Miss brought in two quarterbacks behind him. They brought in Walker Howard from LSU. They brought in Spencer Sanders from Oklahoma State. I was under the impression that Sanders was probably brought here with the hope that he might win the job. Take it from uh, take it from uh, Dart with Howard to be the quarterback of the future. Now Howard may actually be truly the quarterback of the future there, but what I've I guess kind of heard coming out of Oxford as of late is that maybe Sanders is not going to beat out Dart, and maybe Dart's going to end up being the Ole Miss starting quarterback. Well, if that be the case, I think he needs to play better than he did a year ago. The other thing about Ole Miss that I think will be interesting is is you know that's where Pete Golding lands as defensive coordinator, and we saw Golding not exactly do gangbusters work for the Alabama defense, and he had better talent there than he'll have here. But, you know, there's also a sense in which Golding, you know, kind of um, maybe scapegoated for some of the issues that, old, that that Alabama had. So the bottom line here is is that I think that Lane Kiffin needs a better season because I don't think he was too popular with some of his own boosters and fans after the way in which he kind of flirted for, for the, with that Auburn job at the end of last year and obviously lost the Egg Bowl to uh, Mississippi State. Um, I sort of thought they were in the midst of possibly changing over at starting quarterback. Looks like that might not, not be the case. Maybe Dart does hold on there and keep that job for a second year. So this is one of the better teams that Georgia will play by appearance. They were in the top 20 of the ESPN FPI, I guess. But by the time the game takes place, I'm assuming that Ole Miss has lost a few times. So they have the potential of maybe sneaking up on Georgia. Uh, but but I don't know that game's going to have a ton of cachet when it's actually played because of the schedule that Ole Miss will have played prior to that. But thank you for asking. Joe Garliotti says, do you think that Beck turns into a first-round pick? You know, sight unseen, I'm not going to say that. You know, here's the one thing I think you got to understand is that, you know, Bennett gets drafted in the fourth round doing what he did. You know, this isn't just good for quarterbacks in the Kirby Smart era. This is really good for Georgia quarterbacks overall. I mean, how many quarterbacks in the history of the program have been drafted higher than Seth Bennett has been drafted? It's not a long list, I don't believe. Um, So when you factor in Georgia football history and what Stetson Bennett did to kind of put himself near the top of that, I think it's going to be very hard for for Beck to even be as good as Stetson Bennett was. In other words, if Beck is drafted in the fourth round, you know, after next season, then he'll have had, I think, a pretty good year for Georgia. You know, could he could he be better than that? Maybe so. But y'all, I mean, the the hundred plus his. 100, 100 plus year history of Georgia football kind of shows you it is not easy to be drafted in the first round. Georgia just does not have a lot of first round pick quarterbacks in its in its program's history. Um, so that's that would be for me putting a lot on back sight unseen, at least in terms of how he handles a full season. So I would I would say less than that for right now. Uh, Brandon Griffin, very funny kind of comparing uh, Nick Saban to a Bob Sugar and uh, Jerry Maguire. That's funny. Uh, so Jacob says he still thinks that Spencer Sanders wins that s- starting job. You may very well be right. I don't know that I'm all that fully plugged into what's happening there at Ole Miss. When when they brought in Sanders, I assume they were bringing him in to win the job. Seems like I've heard a little bit about Dart as of late, but you may be right about that. Um, let me uh, go around the comment sections again. Spencer Clark mentioning Deion Sanders. That's no doubt been a weird situation the last few days. No doubt about that. Uh, UJ Boy for Life Brunetti says, I never answer his questions. I feel like I answer your questions a lot. Now, I've been on the other comment sections for a minute. When I was on YouTube earlier, I didn't see yours. But I'm glad you're here. Frank Patterson says, uh, BA, these teams draft those Shriners, meaning Alabama, but then they realize they have to put them around 
a lot of Georgia players for them to be successful, which is maybe what's happening there in Philadelphia. That's very funny. Uh, very funny. Jonathan Aaron says, with all that Jimbo Fisher money I got, I should give away 10 cruises next year. Listen, if I got some of that Jimbo Fisher money, I would do that for sure. Um, Nature Gator says, in addition to not knowing what's going on at Ole Miss, I also don't know what's happening in Florida either. Maybe that's the case, although at this point I'm not really quite so sure the Gators know exactly what's happening in Florida right now, unfortunately for them. <laughs> DMR42, this phrase is very funny to me. Uh, he's talking about AOGs, another occupation guy, in other words, <laughs> going professional on something other than football. That's really funny. That's really funny. Um, James Richard says, I don't watch the NFL, but the Atlanta Falcons passing on Jalen Carter sums up the reason for being a losing franchise. And yeah, that's the thing. Like, I'm not going to tell you there is not a reasonable argument to be made for not drafting Jalen Carter uh, and taking Robinson instead. There probably was a reasonable argument for that. But it's hard not to notice how many Georgia fans have come down hard on the Falcons about this, hard on the Falcons. And at a certain point in time, you can't just wipe all that away and disregard it and say, oh, it doesn't matter. These Georgia fans don't know what they're talking about. Do you want them as fans or not? And I'm not saying that you ought to draft your roster with like PR involved, but if you're not going to do that, then you better find out some other way to reach out to these Georgia fans and see if you can get some of that attention for your team on Sundays. I don't think Atlanta does nearly enough of that. I don't. I don't. I think the Braves do far more of that than – uh, the Falcons do, and it doesn't make any sense to me because this is the same sport. You know, the Braves, you could make a case the Braves would have an interest in not playing up Georgia too much because, you know, Braves country is Alabama. You know, you've got huge numbers of Braves fans who are also Bama or Auburn fans. South Carolina, huge number of Braves fans who are Gamecock or Clemson fans all throughout North Carolina. You know that that all of these you know fan bases in these surrounding states they're all Braves fans, and so if the Braves are blowing up Georgia too much, then all of a sudden that potentially hurts them in an area in which they're trying to kind of you know make sure they maintain strong fan base. And yet they still had Stetson Bennett to begin this season. You know they still you know had Jordan Davis and things like that. You know Blooper's been to Braves games. The the mascot's been been to, been to Georgia games before. It's just it, to me it's very noticeable how little public outreach the Falcons seem to do to connect their organization to Georgia fans. This is the most prolific fan base in the entire state of Georgia. You would think the Atlanta Falcons would, be, would want to be more a part of it. I'm not saying that means you need to go out and draft Georgia players, but when you don't draft a Georgia player, what do you do to make sure that Georgia fans know that, that you are open for them to support you? I don't think, I don't think, I don't think the Falcons do enough of that. Um, DMAR42 says taking Vic Beasley was the real killer, yeah. I mean, listen, yeah, Beasley had that one good sack here. Other than that, was not a very productive player, unfortunately. Um, Dogs J, uh, number 24, pointing out that George had 25 players drafted the last two years. That is indeed a record. Um, Allen Hampton says Bama must have serious quarterback problems by taking another quarterback from the portal. And, yeah, not even like a top-shelf type quarterback. Eye-opening indeed. Eye-opening indeed. Antoine Sampson says that Todd Gurley was the biggest Falcons letdown ever. Yeah, you know, that's that's the year they take Beasley. They don't take Gurley. And Gurley goes on to be, you know, I mean, you can make a case he was the best offensive player in the NFL for a couple of years. That's the big miss. Brandon Griffin says, I'd love to see Jalen Carter win Rookie of the Year. Very real possibility given who he's surrounded by. Yeah, I think that's probably fair. All right. Oh boy, got late fast. All right, final comments. We got to get out of here. Back on Facebook for a moment. Uh, Brandon Griffin also, I guess, bouncing back and forth, says edge rushers are plentiful. Finding a stud defensive tackle is rare. Yeah, the interior pass rush that Carter brings, I think, is what bring, makes him such a special talent. Uh, Bob Collins says, I'm an eagle dog. And listen, the, on social media right now, this stuff is real. Now, eventually some of this stuff will kind of fizzle out because these kinds of things always do. But when you've got a organization like the Eagles openly embracing Georgia as much as they are. Georgia fans responding in such big numbers to all of this here at the moment. Um, I mean, that's just noticeable to me. Noticeable to me that that the Falcons organization ought to be doing something 
to reach out to these Georgia fans. That the idea that they feel so little connection to the Falcons, they could just sort of drop them just like that and move on to the Eagles. I'm not saying this is happening to the tune of tens upon tens of thousands. I'm not saying that. But, I mean, when this much social media chatter gets generated so quickly, it's worth paying attention to. Matt Rukavina also pointing out that it's appropriate that Stetson Bennett's back at SoFi Stadium. That is appropriate. Very appropriate indeed. Um, Denise White Loper. Some hard words there for Freddie the Falcon, the mascot. All right, what else? Um, Miriam Corbin says she doesn't want any of our players condemned to the Falcons. So there you go for Miriam on that. Uh, Ken Holcomb, thanks for the kind words. I appreciate that. Barry Watkins kind of pointing out what has been conventional wisdom around football for a while, the idea of not drafting a running back like that at eighth overall in the first round. And while I generally kind of understand where that comes from, I also think that, you know, there's a chance that, hey, if you feel like he's a special talent, you know, maybe that's what Arthur Smith feels like he needs. But it's important to note that Atlanta's kind of swimming upstream against the current current of the current current of the NFL by uh, taking a running back that high. That is true. Randy Hall says we need to get Eddie an Eagles jersey. I will show you this. So our uh, one of our you know our great helpers around here, one of our uh, great IT guys named Paul, uh, he's an Eagles fan, so he made this. So this is Ugga wearing the Eagles jersey. I think that's kind of nice right there, right? That's pretty good. I think that's well done there. So he gave that to me this morning, so I thought that was kind of fun. Yeah, uh, our buddy Paul that works with us gave us that. I thought that was great. Uh, Keith Dog says dogs are killing it in the NFL. They really are. Um uh, George Ann Olive says even the Hawks are Dogs fans now. Trey Young was rooting for them in the national championship. So there you go. There you go. Everybody seemingly doing more of that uh, for sure. All right, we got to go for now. Thanks for being here for our, our R.S. Andrews cool down. Y'all find R.S. Andrews online, rsandrews.com, for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs, uh, including that air conditioning unit, getting it tuned up to factory fresh specs. Important to get that done here right now. Got to make sure you do that. Also check out the AJC online, ajc.com. Uh, you want to follow the – the rest of the NFL draft, what kind of went down there, you can do that there. No doubt uh, get a lot of uh, updates on all of that. Also, what's next for the Braves? Doubleheader today in New York after a lot of rain in the Big Apple here this weekend. And, of course, what's next for the Hawks as their season came to a close last week at the hands of the Boston Celtics. All of that online at AJC.com. And as I said before, check out R.S. Andrews online, rsandrews.com. You want to get your water heater tuned back up to factory fresh specs? R.S. Andrews can help you with that there as well or get your thing replaced the same day. If you run into an issue, you can find all that online at rsandrews.com. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. Good to be back with you again. Dog Nation Daily presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. We'll look forward to talking to you then.